Rub up your engines! G5 says, what happens if I don't do a coolant flush on my car? Got 180,000 miles. I'm the original owner. It's seven years old and I've never cleaned it up. Okay, do it now. Here's the reason why. When my grandfather was young, they used alcohol with water. Problem with that is once it got a little bit warmer, the alcohol would evaporate and then it would all freeze. So then they came out with antifreeze and Back in his days, they made the mistake of calling it permanent antifreeze. You don't have to worry about it like alcohol and water. Well, they found out after a few years it wasn't permanent. It started rusting and corroding and ruined the whole engine and radiator system, right? All coolants eventually wear out. Now, modern coolants are a lot better than it used to be. Your car's still running. You're not complaining about it overheating or anything. So there's a lot better coolant than there used to be, but it still wears out. You find out what kind of coolant your vehicle has. Like you take the best coolants out there are the Holt coolants, hybrid organic acid technology. These usually pink or red. Those can go seven years, 150,000 miles. Now you're past that anyway, so just change it out now. And if you want it to last the longest, replace it with a hot coolant. There's a bunch of companies that make them. They're not just made by one company, but you do want to change it because the additives break down after a while. Then things start to corrode. Now it used to be really bad with the old cars because they were cast iron engine. Cast iron will rust pretty bad. Now they're aluminum and you might think ah, aluminum doesn't rust so I don't have to change it. Uh, big mistake. Aluminum actually corrodes worse than cast iron rust so the corrosion will destroy everything. Just go by the bottle when it says if it says seven years or 150 change it every seven years or 150. If it says five years or 100 change it every five years 100. It's not that hard to change it all out and then you won't have very expensive problems. You can easily do it yourself on a Saturday morning or something uh, if you don't want to pay a mechanic, but do it. Case in White says, what would be a more reliable car upgrade? A turbocharger or a supercharger and which is best for an engine? It depends basically on what kind of money you want to spend, what kind of power you want to get. The superchargers are the easiest to put on because you can get bolt-on superchargers. Turbochargers do the same thing. They ram more air in, but they require an exhaust hookup to hook it up to the exhaust system. Most guys that add them on put on a supercharger. And I know people can say, ah, oh, Scotty, you don't know what you're talking about because more cars are, super, are turbocharged and supercharged. Well, the reason that they're turbocharged is because theoretically by the EPA ratings, they get better gas mileage ratings with a turbocharger because it's not using the fan belt of the en engine to drive it so it gets a little bit better gas mileage. But you don't put those things on to get gas mileage anyways. The more you step on the gas, the more you turn on the turbo or a supercharger, the worse your gas mileage is. They all ram air in and they all increase the pressure inside the engine and they will all wear your car out faster the more they're used. There's no arguing that. But most guys, if you're going to do an upgrade, a supercharger is a lot faster, easier to do and you get instant power. For most guys, if you're adding an on, a supercharger is a much better way to go. King is for good sus. Scotty, can you get away with changing transmission fluid by mileage and not time? If I go 50,000 miles in four years, I certainly don't need to change it every two or three years. You're correct there. I agree entirely. Now, engine oil is a different story. You start up an engine, you're burning hydrocarbons. There's all kinds of pressure, uh, water vapor builds up inside. Over time, the oil goes bad. But an automatic transmission, what does it do? It just spins around. The main wear is by spinning and wearing pieces in the transmission. Age doesn't affect it that much. Transmission fluid has insane additives in it to keep it nice and clear and lubricating. That's why you'll notice if you have a transmission leak in your driveway, it's almost impossible to clean that off the cement because it's got such great additives. Now engine oil, uh, you can always hose that down, clean it with degreaser and get a lot of it off. But if you got a car that's leaking transmission fluid, it gets in your driveway, it's almost impossible to clean all that mess up because that fluid is so strong and it can last so long. So yeah, if you're going to change their transmission fluid and your transmission say every 60,000 miles, if it takes you eight, 10 years to get there, go ahead and do it then. Don't worry about the mileage because it doesn't degrade over time since it's just sitting inside there spinning and you're not putting the mileage. It's not spinning. It really doesn't hurt. It doesn't build up anything like a, a engine oil with the engine blowing up, explosions, firing uh, pistons. It's just sitting there spinning. So yeah, you can get away with it then. 
Scotty two six two says, Scotty, what are your thoughts on an 05 Honda Accord five speed manual? Would be a reliable commuter car. Sure, it doesn't have a million miles on it. <laughs> Those things are pretty well made. And the weak point of them are the automatic transmission sets a standard, just like any car, you're gonna buy a used car, have a mechanic check it out, or at least take it on a really good road test. As those Honda Accords age, some of them fifth gear will pop out of gear. So take it on the highway, have it in fifth gear and floor it. And if it pops out of gear from fifth to neutral, don't buy it because the transmission's worn out. As long as it runs good, doesn't leak any oil. I got a customer for one of those things, got 450,000 miles, still running strong, original engine, original transmission. The only thing you'll have to do is put a clutch in them every once in a while. Toyota Montima says, I have coolant leaking from somewhere in my car. It's steaming out of the hood. And the crankshaft where the pulley is that drives the fan belts is cooling on it. 99% of the time when you got a leak there, it's the water pump. The water pumps are always there in the front of the engine, at least on most cars. And when they leak, water pumps have what are called a weep hole. If your water pump started to go bad, it could push the pressure out and throw the pulley out and do damage to the vehicle. So instead of doing that, there's a weep hole and that fluid and pressure will be released on the bottom of the pump through the little weep hole and then it'll drip on the front of the crank. When I do it, when I test them, I just get a pressure tester, I pump it up and then I look up there with a flashlight and I see water squirting out of the weep hole, you know that's what it is. If you don't have a pressure tester, hey, pay a mechanic to test them. Or if it's leaking enough, just run the car, turn it off and quick get a flashlight and look up on that water pump bottom, that little weep hole on the bottom of it and you see it dripping, you know it needs a water pump. It's almost always a water pump when they drip there. Pray it's not the head gasket leak because sometimes if they leak on the front, they'll come out there and that's a big expensive job. Coffee guy says, hey, I got an unusual one. What class of car would you recommend for a conversion to electric vehicles? Of course, you want to go smaller. That's what they do in Europe now. There's a company in Europe that for 5,000 euros will convert smaller cars like Volkswagens, little Fiats to electric cars. And it makes the most sense because the less weight the electric motors have to pull, the more efficient they're going to be. I mean, if money is no object, <laughs> I know Neil Young a while back, he had like a big old 1950s, I guess, Ford or something converted. He's a multimillionaire. What does he care what it costs? And he drives around in that and it's an electric car. And he spent a lot of money on it because he's got a lot of money. And there's a lot of small cars out there, even a little Corolla a little Honda Civic. You can get an older one cheap enough, convert that over. You would be better off going small than large because the larger you're going to need more power and it's going to have to pull all that weight. Smaller is better if you're going to make an electric car. Unless, like I said, you're like Neil Young, you got all kinds of money. You want to get an old big 50s Ford and turn it into an electric car? Go right ahead. You know, it's your money. But practically, you're better with a smaller car. Spider-Man 55 says, Scotty, I got an 03 Saab 95. It runs great, but when it's in park, it idles well. When you put it in drive, it starts shaking. It doesn't take off very well. What could be wrong? Saab 95 was one of the worst vehicles they ever made. Their transmissions would go out all the time, and 99% I'm sure that your transmission is going out. That's typical on those things. It's a 17-year-old Saab. One of the reasons they went bankrupt was because that 9.5 was such a piece of junk, the company doesn't even exist anymore. If you can find a Saab mechanic, if there's any left anywhere, maybe it's some kind of a computer failure, or a sensor, or a shift solenoid, because if it isn't that, it means the transmission's going out, junk the car. It's not worth fixing. In the day when people actually fixed those, and they still sold them in the United States, rebuilding a transmission like that, I've seen people spend anywhere from four to six thousand dollars. Car's not worth that. Car's not worth fifteen hundred dollars, as far as I'm concerned. So if you can find a Saab mechanic, at least have him check it out, see if he can fix it. If he can't. Just get rid of the stupid thing. It's not worth it. There's a weird one. Someone says, I got a 2013 RAV4 with a unique problem. In very cold weather, when the temperature is below 20, the radio won't work until the car warms up. And once it warms up 10 or 15 degrees, the radio starts working. It's been doing this ever since I had the car. What could be wrong? Well, they obviously built something wrong. There's some kind of a weak connection, power connection, and it gets too cold, it won't work. And then once it warms up, it starts going. It could be that. More often, since you said it's happened since you've had the car, it's probably the radio was just poorly built. And inside the circuit board of the radio, it just wasn't built right that when it gets cold, it doesn't conduct electricity. But once it gets warmer, then it starts working. I had kind of a similar problem. When I was a kid, I had a stereo and it started acting up. So I thought, eh, 
how am I going to figure this out? I don't know how those circuits work. So I got my mother's hair dryer, and I started heating up parts of the amplifier circuit board. And when I got to a certain part, it would start to work. So I saw, well, there's this uh, resistor there. So I soldered it off, went to Radio Shack, got a new resistor, and soldered it in, and then it worked fine after that. I'm assuming you probably got some kind of a minor circuit flaw on the radio. And, I mean, if you don't mind waiting for it to warm up, and it's been doing it for, what, uh, seven years? Keep doing it. If not, you're probably going to need a new radio. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.